Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mary. Um, welcome everyone to this special Friday forum. Um, this is in collaboration with the Southeast Asia Research Group, which I'm a part of. Um, the center has always graciously given us opportunities, um, asking us for possible um, speakers. And uh, our speaker this uh, afternoon was um, nominated, suggested by one of our members, Rodlin uh, Bantin. Um, she was supposed to, she's supposed to introduce the speaker, but um, unfortunately she's not feeling well. Although Rodlin is here. Hi, Rodlin. And um, I will just read her introduction um, and then we will move from there. Okay. Um, so this is Rodlin's introduction I'll be reading. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rodlin May Banting and I'm a first year master's student in the Gender and Women's Studies program where I plan to focus my research on Filipina identity formation within the diaspora. I have been given the pleasure of introducing Dr. Dada Dokot for this week's Friday Forum. First, I will begin with a land acknowledgement and then move into my formal introduction. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land a place their nation has called Dejop since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. I'd also like to acknowledge the current state of the Philippines in the wake of Typhoon Ulysses, a typhoon that occurred mere weeks after Super Typhoon Raleigh, which was projected to be the strongest typhoon of the year. These natural disasters and the subsequent lack of adequate or appropriate response from the administration compound the already tenuous situation of Filipinos across the nation, driving them deeper into insecurity. Among the most affected areas is Dr. Dokot's hometown, Nabua, in the Bicol region of Southern Luzon. A link to US-based relief efforts is now posted in the chat. I was first introduced to Dr. Dokot back in April during the first Philippinex PowerPoint party, the online iteration of a gathering that originally took place in a small cafe in Queens, where Philippinex scholars based in New York would get together to informally share their work in a generative and supportive setting of Kababayans. At this pandemic adapted gathering, I learned about her research on Filipino seafarers and the new precarities to which they were subjected in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, their liminality embodied by the Philippine government's refusal to take care of its OFWs or overseas Filipino workers in the wake of global disaster. The ways in which Dr. Dokot centers her people in her work is something that drew me to her scholarship and something that I believe will be evident in her presentation today entitled Postcolonial Anxieties, Two Stories from the Town of Dollars, Philippines. Dada Dokot is a cultural and visual anthropologist whose work focuses on Filipino overseas migration and is currently an assistant professor in the anthropology department at Purdue University. She obtained her PhD in anthropology at the University of British Columbia, her master's degree in human security studies in the department of anthropology at the University of Tokyo, and her bachelor's in journalism at the University of the Philippines. Her work has had global reach, receiving support from New York University, Shanghai, the Liu Institute of Global Issues, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, Canada, University of British Columbia, and the Ministry of Education, Japan, among others. Committed to cultivating in intentional community spaces within the diaspora, Dr. Dokot also co-founded the UBC Philippine Studies series a student-led initiative that highlights academic work, community action and art, and provides a venue for the discussion of Philippine issues in Vancouver. Her film projects, 
which explore the more personal and intimate facets of Filipino labor migration, have also been presented at the Society of Visual Anthropology's Film Festival, the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver, the Cultural Center of the Philippines in Manila, the Caixa Forum in Barcelona, Caixa, Caixa Forum in Barcelona, the Red House Center for Cultural Debate in Sofia, Bulgaria, among others. She is currently working on a book project that hones in on her ethnographic field work in her hometown. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Dada Dokot. Hi, thanks so much. Thanks so much for the wonderful introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. So um, should I start my talk? Yes. Okay. Oh. Hi, I'm just checking if uh, you can see my video. We can see your PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Okay, all right. In an opinion piece that I published in June of this year, the link to which I attached, um, I included in the abstract of my talk, I wrote about the pervasive anti-Black attitudes that circulate in the daily life of Filipinos. It is common in the Philippine media to assign comedic roles to actors with dark skin. Filipino politicians are not exempt as Filipinos tend to criticize more sternly those with dark skin as if having a dark skin naturally links with you with corruption. This anti-blackness is carried on in the diaspora. Elaine Castillo's novel, America is Not the Heart, opens with her character's recollection of how, when growing up in the Philippines, her brownness oriented her perception not only of herself, but also those of those with lighter and darker skin of color. The first sentence reads as follows. So you were a girl and you were poor and you're poor, but at least you're light skinned. That will save you. In my article, I argue that attitudes of anti-Blackness among people of color, such as Filipinos, are linked with the formation of a racialized hegemonic consciousness that privileges whiteness and dehumanizes the colonized other. I asked, how come Filipino post-colonial consciousness or sensitivities echo our former colonizers' anti-Black attitudes rather than sympathize with the formerly colonized, such as ourselves and enslaved peoples? I also discuss how the formation of the US military superstructure that recruited colonized peoples to racialized ranks reserved only for people of color created the space for racialized labor resource extraction. To expand my article, my arguments in my article, I will introduce two stories from my own ethnographic work in my hometown in the Philippines. I will argue that the racialization of people in the Philippines during the Spanish and American colonization contributed to the formation of anti-Blackness among Filipinos in the Philippines and in the diaspora that reverberates in the everyday discourse until today. The first story that I would like to highlight is um, a clip from my film titled Restless or uh, Baad ng Pauno in, my, in our hometown's language. And the second one is about a monument in my hometown, which I pair with a narrative about the town's foundation reaffirmed annually, um, a narrative about the town's foundation reaffirmed annually during the town festival. These two stories expand the context of colorism in the Philippines, which is intimately linked with how peoples in the archipelago were historically othered by the West within a discourse of anti-Blackness. These stories are rooted in Nabua, my hometown, which is called the town of dollars by its people. Nabua is a river and agricultural town in the southeastern part of the Zon Island, Philippines. In the map, you can see that there's a Navy man icon and my hometown is located somewhere in that uh, area. 
On the slide is the official seal of my hometown. At the center of it is an image of a Navy man wearing a cap, and he is surrounded by images of agricultural produce characteristic of our town, such as taro and other um, plants. And here are some photos to introduce briefly how my hometown looks like. The first image is uh, a typical landscape of the agricultural farms. And during the typhoon season, uh, the, uh, the rice fields become flooded, as you can see in the second photo. In the third photo, you can see um, a crafts uh, woman weaving bamboo baskets, one of the disappearing forms of livelihood in the town. And um, annually, we also celebrate um, the town festival. And in the evening, there is uh, an event called the Balikbayan Night. Uh, I think many towns in the Philippines have such nights. This is uh, the time when overseas Filipino workers and immigrants come home and uh, dance um, at the center of the town and celebrate uh, in the evening. And uh, this photograph is, a, um, uh, it shows the Washington, a replica of the Washington Monument in my hometown, as it is called the Town of Dollars. It is uh, quite small. And the second one is um, a photograph showing U.S. Naval retirees gathering annually at the center of the town to celebrate the U.S. Memorial Day. And here, um, it is important to remember that they are uh, the salute and the celebration is not for Filipino uh, Filipinos in the in the Filipino Navy, but for the American Navy. And in both uh, the, the in both photographs, you can see the American and Philippine flags showing uh, both um, displayed. To provide you with some context, in 1898, after 300, 33 years of colonization, Spain relinquished the Philippines together with Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Guam to the US under the Treaty of Paris. Nabo's self-ascribed nickname today is linked to the historical events of 1901 when US President William McKinley signed an executive order that launched the racialized enlistment of the first 500 Filipinos into the US Navy. Filipinos could only join the steward rank, tasked to mop floors, clean the ships, kitchens, tidy officers' bunks, and also shine the Navy officers' boots. Filipinos worked alongside Black people, and no white people were admitted to this rank. In the context of scarcity brought on by the colonial transition from Spain to the US, and the never ending epidemics and sporadic drought, the young men of Nabua, mostly from farming families, found routes for joining the US Navy. According to the retirees that I interviewed, joining the Navy provided them with an option for travel and upward mobility, even if they recognized that they practically joined the US Navy as slaves. During the Spanish occupation, education was reserved for the elites, and the majority were peasants with no land of their own to till. Maria Lagones, a philosopher, um, Latin American uh, philosopher, writes that oppressed people make choices within the limited options made available to them by their oppressors. This insight is arguably applicable in the case of people from a hometown who found themselves joining the Navy of our newly arrived colonizer. The recruitment of Filipinos into the US Navy stopped in 1991 when the Philippine Supreme Court voted on the unconstitutionality of the US bases in the Philippines, but perceptions about success had already been heavily transformed by the enlistment of Nabuenyo Navy men, um, Nabuenyo men in the US Navy. The Navy men would come home to Nabua with US dollars, married the town's most beautiful women, and built grand mansions that stood out against the expansive rice fields. Intergenerationally dispossessed during the Spanish colonization, when tracts of land were converted to encomiendas, with nothing to inherit from their parents and wanting to uplift themselves from landlessness or the oppressive practices of sharecropping, they saved up their naval salaries and built up the aspiration to own land. The stories they brought home about the US, the gigantic boxes they shipped back to the town of dollars filled with the scent of America, and the idea about America's greatness and benevolence 
fortified this fortified desire fortified desires among people in my hometown to try their luck in the land in the land of the colonizers. So with that, I would like to um, introduce a bit of my family story. Like the US Navy man, my family members also found themselves traveling to and working in the US. Following this introduction about my hometown and its brief history and how it transformed to become the town of dollars, I will next show a five minute excerpt from my film, Restless. It is a comedy documentary of my mother's two day preparation for her application for a tourist visa at the embassy in Manila. Later, I will be linking this clip to the anxieties about brownness that have become deeply entrenched in the Filipino mind. Can you hear? There's no sound. Oh. I think I have to share uh, sound, share computer sound. Yes, yeah. We can read the, the subtitles though. Okay. Sound? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Ma What is the purpose of your application for visit? Kasi nakapira interview na ka. Sabi ni Manu, ba't isyo? Ibabayag mo to, gusto niya maritrato. Hindi siya ritrato ko nung grandson. This is my first grandson. I don't wanna see him in picture alone. I want to see him and kiss him. Isyo na siya na kaya ito ritrato? No when you grow as old as I am, you would want to see your first grandson. Maray bed king babay, yun ang maraya mag-interview. Kada pirming babay, lalaki. Lalaki? Ah, kaya ikay papasar. Puti mo yabi, babay. Tapos to kanya na ba puti? Kaya ako nga ni, retrato pa siya, na-denied na ako. Sabihan ako, Kansa, sigurado nga yata ang middle ta. I look at the certification na ako from the GILG. My term ends 2010. If I do not come back, they might sue me for negligence of duty. How much do you earn? A very small. But I want also to serve. If you do not pass me, this will be my last. I don't wanna be interviewed by you fools. May fools like you. Nakapin ang interview na ka ba? Second pa sa nayan. My hair is graying. I wanna go to the States. Otherwise, I won't try because I'm getting so frustrated already. Not seeing my grandson and my American son-in-law. How about your daughter? Oh, if you only know how I miss her. I have to see her now. I did not see her during her wedding. And the most important thing is for me to see my grandson. I don't have happiness anymore because I don't have any husband. I said to my wife, I'm going to go to the house. I said, I'm going to go to the house. Hey, 
Adibuday ko amo ko ipat video ta nganing mabayada sa mga binatan ko pang din ko kanya. Sabi mo Ya, lang gatol kin mag mag apri patikin magnuwa pa na. Ano ta naman ka unon halo-halo? All right, so the film is set in a small studio apartment that I rented upon returning to Manila from my MA in Tokyo. My mother and aunt were visiting from Nabwa, which is a 14 hour overnight bus ride away. The filming of this documentary was serendipitous. Upon seeing my mother and aunt's entertaining unscripted conversation about my mother's visa preparations, I decided to turn on my camera. The clip begins with my mother cooking rice and doing various errands within the limits of the small space. My mother's sister, my aunt, also appears in the film as she had come to Manila for my mother's big task. In the rest of the film, my mother tries on several sets of clothes, jewelry, and shoes, and rehearses with me answers to the questions that could be asked by the interviewing American consular officer. The film ends with my aunt and I waiting anxiously at a donut shop across the embassy, wondering if my mother would be lucky that day to receive her most wanted visa to finally visit my sister whom she had not seen for over 10 years. At the heart of my mother's and my aunt's anxiety is their awareness that their darkness renders their responses unbelievable to the white consul. Despite their carefully chosen outfit, meticulously prepared documentation of resources that they will be using during the visit, and their sincerest intention to return to the Philippines after the planned short tour, they felt that their brownness somehow turns them into desperate liars. My mom and aunt were certain that I had passed my, th my tourist visa interview a few years earlier because my skin is somewhat whiter than the typical Filipinos. They like white skin, my aunt said. My aunt thought that the mere sight of her dark face on the photograph attached to her application would probably lead to an automatic rejection. The clip ended with my aunt's testimony that the interview with visa process makes her nervous. My mom replied somberly in an agreement that we are all humans, but they were just born a bit whiter, suggesting a simple task like visa application should not cause this much anxiety. They discriminate against those who have dark faces, my aunt said. And that is why she asked Auntie Baby, who is a nurse in California, to send her a whitening cream so she could fix herself as if she is broken and perhaps finally emerge successful in her next tourist visa application. <laughs> In the film, we leave my tiny apartment and take the train to the Quiapo Church in Manila, a famous site for pilgrimage for those who feel like they need divine intervention in having their wishes come true. At this church, my mother and aunt personally delivered their prayers to the church's patron called the Black Nazarene, a sculpture of the kneeling Christ carrying a cross. The sculpture was brought to the Philippines from Mexico in the early 1600s via the Gallium trade. In the article, the Burnt Christ, the Filipinization of a Mexican Icon, Filipino anthropologist Fernando Zielcita uses the framework of acculturation to argue that the image of the suffering Black Christ acquired both new and familiar meanings among devotees in the Philippines. Drawing from literature on Blackness in sacred iconography in Europe and the Americas, Zielcita argues that Blackness appears to be associated with earth, rain, and fertile soil, Blackness also signified the dignity of being non-white, and Black icons such as the Virgin of Guadalupe attracted peasant devotion. In his interviews with devotees of the Black Nazarene in Manila, Zielcita finds that the icon's Blackness is associated with sea and fire and with destruction and survival. 
unaware about the historical galleon that transported the Black Nazarene from Mexico to the Philippines. Devotees believe that the icon's color was changed by an accident, perhaps by fire, and thus blackness was not natural but accidental. An informant of Zielcita suggested that the Black Nazarene was perhaps Filipino, meaning brown, before World War II, but that its color was blackened by the flames of war. Based on his informant's testimonies, Zelosito argues that perceptions about the icon's color do not appear to signify a liberation from prejudices against dark features, and they instead reinforce the status quo that values light over dark skin. The history of the Indio manned Spanish galleons that transported not only labor and goods, but also religious icons between Manila and Acapulco is slipping away from the Filipino people's collective memory. In the meantime, that blackness is accidental means that blackness is assigned negative and degenerative connotations. In the context of Filipino devotion, the Nazarene's blackness is used to demonstrate the power of the sacred, which had protected its representation from harm. Looking for miracles within uncertainty, Filipino devotees deploy their trust in the power of the divine while using racial hierarchies that degrade blackness to mere accidents. Cielcita writes that, black, that the Black Nazarene is popular among Filipinos of modest social standing, who seem to feel greater closeness to the sacred statue due to, their, due to its uh, darker skin. As much as they have come to internalize that their brownness is a negative feature, my mother and aunt, as we have seen in the film, entrusted their hopes and prayers with and found comfort in the image of the Black Christ in Manila. I was raised in a culture that privileges white skin. The cosmetic industry in the Philippines capitalizes on tropical fruits such as papaya for bleaching Filipinos' varied skin tones. This privileging of whiteness among people in the islands may have existed during pre-colonial times as whiteness may have been linked to class and high social status. But certainly, aspirations for white skin became more deeply rooted during the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines, an expansion founded on ideas about European racial hierarchy over the dark, inferior, and savage natives in the islands. Historian Rizil Mujares, for example, in his biography of the first Filipino anthropologist, Pedro Paterno, wrote that Paterno sought to create an archive about the Philippines' rich and deep history. Paterno pushed for ways that the Filipino people's notion of self could be cultivated. He also organized ethnological fairs in Europe and wrote about the Philippines' pre-colonial history with which Mohara says were an exercise in fantasy and guesswork, but which were, however, a strategy at claims making that the Philippines deserved its spot among countries with great and distinct civilizations. In one of his works, Paterno uses the Agta, people, or the Aita, or the Itas, to make claims about Filipinos' Aboriginal origin. According to Mujares, Paterno uses in his book a classic evolutionist outline that directly appropriates European accounts on the Philippines and its peoples at that time. Here, Paterno begins by depicting the Agta society's environment, religion, and cultural practices, and portrays the development of Philippine society in civilizational stages from Aboriginal life to the hybrid civilization, civilization Christiana. In this timeline, the Agta people were portrayed to eventually die out due to their supposed chosen environment, the mountains, their supposed biological limitations, and their supposed intellectual simplicity. Paterno wrote in Spanish and quite problematically wrote with an imperial gaze. Through his writing, Paterno, like the intellectuals of his generation, constantly repositioned himself in proximity with Spain, crafting a narrative that he is close to them in skin tone and intellect, following the evolutionary timeline. He did not claim his Filipino Chinese heritage and he mimicked the language and comportment of Spanish colonizers. As Mujeres wrote in his book, that traces the history of the Philippines based on the biographies of people whom he called uh, the brains of the nation, Paterno felt hampered by his inferior and colonized race and stated that he wished he could erase his color. Returning to the clip that I shared today, my mother and aunt's concerns about their brownness 
and my enculturation into a family and society that believed that my relatively fair skin is a privilege can be traced back to the generational struggle of Filipinos in claiming their legitimacy in the face of the European discourse that crafted the colonized as dark and degenerate savages who were supposed to move closer to what is human by following the bright light of enlightenment and aiming for proximity to whiteness. It is here that I move to my next story, the statue of the three actas in my hometown. A monument called the three actas stands at the heart of Nabwa's downtown runabout. It epitomizes Nabwa's claim to indigeneity and pre-colonial history. Built in 1997 by the municipal government of Nabwa, the statue depicts indigenous aitas or actas called negritos by the Spanish colonizers, carrying a bamboo slit drum sculpted as if offering a ceremonial dance to the gods. The National Commission for Culture and the Arts in the Philippines describes the Agta as having dark colored skins, short stature, and kinky hair. As much as the people of Nabwa would like to honor the Agta by elevating them to the most prestigious spot at the very center of the town, <laughs> there is actually no um, Agta settlement in Nabwa. The, neighbor, the neighboring city of Iriga where the Agta have settlements has critiqued Nabwa for appropriating Agtas in our town's narrative on how it became a Christian town. On the 2nd of May every year, a street parade pa passes through the roundabout where the monument of the three Agtas stands. The parade ends at the quadrangle of my high school where the participants convene into groups to retell the story of Nabwa's foundation. The town's supposed history is repeated throughout the day of the, to, throughout the day on the microphone. The narrative is set, is set sometime in the early years of Spanish colonial arrival in the area, which was occupied by independent villages headed by chiefs. As the story goes, a local chief's daughter named Laipani was suffering an ailment that the healers could not cure. Laipani was carried to the river so the community could begin their petition to the God who was believed to reside there. On the way to the river, the group accompanying Laipani passed by a crowd of fellow villagers who were receiving baptism from a Spanish friar. The chief reprimanded them for allowing themselves to be baptized into the Christian faith. At that instant, the chief fainted in the midst of his angered reprimand. The Spanish priest quickly baptized the chief who then awoke miraculously healed. The sickly daughter was also healed after her baptism. On the slide is the contemporary depiction of Leipani in the festivals in Nabua. Leipani here is wearing a gown, most likely very far from what peoples in the area wore during the early years of colonial arrival. And here she is carrying the image of the mother of Christ to show the embrace of the Christian faith. And uh, this photograph I found, it's a public photograph from Facebook that I found because I don't have access to my files right now because of COVID. And um, uh, I can forward the slides to people so that they can access the source of the image. And here is a photograph of the street dance taken during the annually held festival. In this narrative about Nabwa's first miracle, Christian conversion brought by the colonial encounter marks the beginning of Nabwa salvation from life's uncertainties, such as diseases and calamities. The oral history that is passed on to the people of Nabwa today through the festival arguably reflects what James Idair calls ethnogenesis in the Philippines, or the process that indigenized the native population through religious conversion. Scholar of Southeast Asia, R.J. May argues that the Spanish colonial period produced three major ethnic blocs in the Philippines, the Christianized mainstream Filipinos, the cultural minorities who identify with indigenous communities that historically resisted colonization, and the Muslim Filipinos with roots in Southern Philippines. These categories, May argues, present a narrative of either assimilation into the colonial religion or indigenous resistance. What the narrative from the festival tells us is that of reduction or the formation of settlements organized around the Christian faith following Spanish arrival, which in turn led to the transformation of independently headed native settlements 
into compact encomiendas or villages that could easily that could be easily missionized and taxed, and whose residents could be enslaved. In this narrative, the local population is portrayed as a sickly people who needed salvation, even if the colonial archives from the town indicate hundreds of deaths from diseases that were most likely brought in by the colonial arrival. And these are excerpts from the town's local archives called the Cuaderno. Oh, this is a portrait of a, of a young Aita. Ferdinand Blumentritt, an Australian ethnologist, published a monograph that compiled all European studies about the peoples in the Philippines up to 1882. Works by European scholars such as Blumentritt were emulated by Filipino mestizo scholars such as Paterno. Blumentritt argued that the Altas eventually receded to the mountains to accommodate the arrival of the so-called brown-skinned Malays, who were supposedly more advanced than the Altas. The arrival of the Spanish then created the group of mestizos. And the portrait here of Blumentritt was drawn by Juan Luna, who was a Filipino mestizo painter. Blumentritt was also very close friends with um, a lot of scholars and artists, including the great novelist Jose Rizal, whose works helped spark the Filipino revolution against Spain. And uh, meanwhile, we also have um, German anthropologist Rudolf Virchow, who measured the skulls of Altas and annotated them as bestial and ape-like, and which gave the impression of ugliness. Same as Blumentritt, uh, Virchow, Virchow, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, concluded that Altas were lower than other Filipinos. In this ethnological works, Aitas were portrayed as occupying the first stages of human progression, which was defined by savagery, powerlessness, and um, powerless as they were doomed to be replaced by the more, the, by the more modern Malays and mixed race Filipinos, and were essentially people without will, identity, and character. Blumentritt and Firchov never set foot in the Philippines, and they had concocted their perspectives about the Philippines out of the pages of ethnological reports and samples gathered by other Europe European explorers traveling to the Spanish colonies at that time. Well, the oral history during the town festival celebrates a narrative of assimilation, one can argue that the unhistoricized appropriation of the Altas in Naboa, where there are no Altas settlements, echoes racist and evolutionary colonial science about the supposed defeat of the original inhabitants in the town who had to withdraw to the mountains in the neighboring city of Iriga. Without consent or permission from the Altas living only less than five miles away, the statue of the three Altas appears like an empty commemoration. The Buenos have learned to perpetuate the racialized narratives of the Altas, whose monument shows them as frozen in time, as if having nothing else to do but play bamboo slit drums and dance. Meanwhile, in the neighboring city that I mentioned earlier, where there are no, where there are Agta settlements, they celebrate their festival in February annually. In this fiesta, Agtas lead the parade in their traditional regalia, and they carry their hunting gear and bamboo slit drums. Poet filmmaker scholar Christian and Don Cardero, who comes from the city, writes that the participation of the Alta in the street parade serves to signify them as um, the unvanquished and the original inhabitants of the land. Their presence in the festivals marks the difference between us, the missionized peoples in the lowlands, and them, the supposed first peoples in the civilizational timeline implanted in the Filipino mind by eugenics that justified imperial racial capitalisms globally. Their presence is supposed to inspire spectators to trace their roots and to reground, but not necessarily to move them to reflect on the violences of multiple colonialisms on the indigenous peoples and on ourselves, and to agitate um, against post-colonial governments regimes, consistent work of abandoning the rights claims and needs of indigenous peoples such as the Agtas. The appropriation of the indigenous supposed mysticism, 
essence, creativity, and craft by Christianized Filipinos, whether in Navajo or in the diaspora, may be reminiscent of Europe's of, um, I got lost, maybe reminiscent of, um, of Europe's racist evolutionary perspectives that tokenize the black other while celebrating a narrative that has erased the dispossession, enslavement, violence, and death that occurred upon the reduction perpetuated by elite post-colonial regimes. So I would like to um, direct us to philosopher Franz Fanon and his work, Dark Skin, White Masks, as a way of ending. Inferiority complex, according to Fanon, is the outcome of a double process. First, it is primarily economic, and this is followed by the internalization of a perceived inferiority. He calls the second phase epidermalization. Fanon tells us that each colonized person in the world has suffered the brunt of inferiority complex created during long years when the colonized person's cultural originality was buried in the civilizational discourses of the colonized, of the colonial metropoles. In the process of inching towards the expected universal, Fanon argues that colonized peoples elevated, are elevated from their so-called jungle status by, renown by renouncing their own blackness and their own bro brownness and their own jungle. Finally, I would like to end my presentation by making use of this platform to draw the audience's attention to the most recent events that devastated the region in my hometown, in which my hometown is located. Super Typhoon Goni, the world's strongest typhoon landed in my region two weeks ago at signal number five or about 220 miles per hour. I think we have all seen photos of the tragedy and with coronavirus on top of these unfortunate calamities in the islands worsened by climate change. So um, friends of mine are raising funds to help poor and indigenous communities in my region. I placed on the slide a poster with the bank and people information of uh, for those interested in extending assistance for the relief and community building efforts led by my friend and collaborator Christian Sindon Cordero of Savage Mind Bookshop, as well as his uh, other, the other members of his team. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dada, for that uh, in very insightful and um, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to open out the floor for q and We're especially encouraging students um, to come forward with questions for Dada. Um, you could type in the questions in the chat or... Um, use the raise or, hand function. Yeah, raise, use the raise hand function, yeah. Or you can type into the chat, I have a question. Yeah, sure, yeah. Maybe I could start with my first question, Dada. Um, yeah, sure. So where, where, um, where did you start uh, going into this line of research? Yeah, so um, I think in anthropology, its history tells us that we often study the other, right? That it's uh, just very recently that uh, we have that more anthropologists from their own communities are returning and working and researching in their own fields. But historically, especially uh, in the history of anthropology in the Philippines, it's often um, people from Europe or from the US who came as part of the imperial project, right? To investigate what's happening there, to map the islands and to in some ways contribute to um, producing knowledge that would help colonize uh, the a particular place. Um, I think uh, when I was deciding to choose my doctoral project, it was actually a little bit challenging because it's common, I think, for anthropologists of their own communities to be discouraged by people to study their, in their own uh, space. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I think it took me, it took the help of a lot of my friends um, at the University of British Columbia when we organized among ourselves to, you know, to help each other and to really be okay with studying our own communities. In fact, there was a, when I went to this um, famous conference, uh, it's like uh, the most famous one, ICOFIL, and mm -hmm. there was an international conference uh, on the Philippines. I was waiting to uh, hear, to talk to a particular person, and I wanted to talk to them about my hometown, researching in my hometown. And uh, this scholar told me, well, um, maybe it's better to study another place because studying their own community will be very dramatic and painful, right? And he's not incorrect, it's true. Because <laughs> it took me eight years to finish my PhD and I think others take more, but uh, others also, a lot of, some people also take maybe four or five years and it took me eight years. And a lot of it was also spent on um, being in pain, right? When you see, for example, archives about your hometown, about reading about the, even until now, when I remember it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so um, it's hard to read these archives about your town suffering and violence against your own people, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, um, we have a question uh, in the chat box. This comes from Susan. Um, so her question is, where are you with the film you created with your mom and aunt? Um, is it already finished? Or if so, when and how can we view it? Oh, yeah, I can send the link. Yeah. I'll look for it and um, yeah, so you I shot the, the entire film, right? Yes, it's from finished. your point of view. Uh, yes, so it's actually quite old. It's uh, from 2009, and uh, it was uh, shown before in the Filipino channel, in the mm. diaspora, and um, yeah, my mom's already here. She's outside cooking uh -oh. <laughs> our lunch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I saw your tweet earlier that your mom was self-deprecating. I was deprecating you like, mm, Dada, you, I don't like your film. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just um, understand why people watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask also, like, why do you think that is very hard for people to study their own, I, I guess, I, their own communities? or their own place. You mentioned earlier, it's, it's painful. Um, yeah, why do you think that's, that's the case? Um, first, in terms of disciplinary traditions, it's um, not encouraged, I think, to, or but now because we are decolonizing, right? A lot of fields mm -hmm. are decolonizing and a lot of practitioners also. I think uh, Stephen, uh, he told me a shout out to Stephen Acovado. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, so, um, there's a lot of, um, in the discipline, we are trained even to, even the, in Anthropology 500 or in the, in the graduate course, the, the texts that we read are basically about uh, people studying other communities. And it was, it's only, I think, it was only, I think, in the fourth year or so when I, when I started reading up on the colonizing work that I came to discover that it's okay to study your own communities. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, I think it's common to read a text about the other. For example, in the Philippines, of course, we know that of um, Renato Rosaldo's work, and it's very important, right, about imperial, the imperialist uh, nostalgia. But I would also be okay with reading my uh, mentor's works in the first mm -hmm. year, like Martin Manalan San, Stephen Acabado, Una Paredes and uh, others, right? But we don't get to read them because the canon, the anthropological canon um, is mainly focused on Margaret Mead and Bronislav Malinowski and other methods which are oriented about studying the others. When we could start with uh, my, my Bible. <laughs> uh, my Bible is a textbook called, uh, a, a collection called Decolonizing Anthropology, right? I mean, you could start mm -hmm. um, Anthropology 500 or any other fields with decolonizing text instead of pushing them towards the end of a student's training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Susan had a, a follow-up. Um, a portion of your clip made her tear up. So she, that's oh. why she was interested with uh, watching your, your film. Okay, oh, oh, go, go ahead. 
Oh, it's just when I when I showed it before uh, at the Red House Center for Cult for I forgot the name Red House Center for Culture and Debate in Sofia in Bulgaria, a student or an, one of the members, one of the people in the audience came up to me crying, and she really wanted to know if my mother got her visa because the film ends has a cliffhanger. We don't show if she gets the visa or not. Mm, okay. <laughs> Interesting. You mentioned Stephen. Stephen is here. He was our speaker uh, last week in Friday Forum. Hi, hi, Stephen. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, well, Stephen and I are also from the same region. Oh, Bicol. Yeah, Bicol, okay. yeah. Milanos. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a question from Aida. Hi, Aida. Um, hi. So Aida says, thank you so much for your presentation, Dada. I'm wondering if you see the Black Lives Matter movement impacting anti-racist sentiments within the Filipino diaspora and whether the social justice movement in the U.S. against anti-Blackness is impacting social perceptions in the Philippines? Yes, um, I believe so. I think the Black Lives Matter movement is very powerful. And um, over the summer, when the Black Lives Matter protests were ongoing, there were a lot of conversations in the diaspora, right? From Twitter, from um, major events that gathered like 20,000 views for several days, particularly just centered on the Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter protests and how it's affecting um, Filipino American communities, right? And even in, aside from this large conversations online, I think we can say that conversations are also happening in our homes, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Um, during dinner table, dip table conversations or discussions about the elections. And I think before it was just, uh, at least in my experience, when we talk about it, it's kind of just like a, a story that is, you know, told in racist overtones. Mm -hmm. But now um, it's a moment to engage our elders, right? Mm -hmm. On why these perceptions are wrong. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. I posted a link in our chat. Uh, this is Dada's uh, article in Rappler, which actually is really related with Ida's uh, question. So yeah, you might want to uh, read that article also. Uh, thank you, Ida, for the question. Thank you, Ida. Yeah. Uh, Jib. Hi, Jib. <laughs> thank you for your interesting presentation. How do you define post-colonial in your research? <laughs> Um, is it a period after colonization or do you have other definitions in mind? Could you also explain more about, um, so the second part would be, could you explain more about your theories and methodologies uh, you have been using to decolonize the colonial imperial knowledge in your research? Jib is also in the anthropology department. Hi, hi Jib. Yeah, that's a, an important question, right? I sent my, the draft of my book proposal recently to one of my mentors, Martin, Dr. Martin Mendelanzan. Mm -hmm. And he told me that I, am, I seem to be using post-colonial and decolonial as synonyms, but he pointed out to me that they are, these are very different, right? So I started reading up more to, to make it clear to myself how they are different. And um, I mean, we could... Uh, like the, for for example, for Franz Fanon and others, the colonial the decolonial period is the point at which uh, people colonized peoples begin realize begin to realize that all of this must be disentangled, right? So just the mention of that, just that consciousness, that awareness is supposed to be a decolonial period. But I think in history, it could also, as I'm reading up, it could also mean the point after colonization. So it's a historical period. Mm -hmm. And I think in the Philippines, it's really hard. I think as I'm thinking about this also in terms of my book project, what I'm beginning to use is the concept of, I think I want to call it multiple colonialisms or multiple colonization in the same way that others are also thinking about the Philippines layered histories. Because it's not just uh, Spain, right? It's also Spain, it's Spain, the US and Japan. And when we think about, for example, very particular um, an event, for example, a ritual. When anthropologists, for example, study ritual, it's very common for anthropologists to use particular tropes, such as using Victor Turner's idea of the communitas, or you know, to analyze a particular event. But in the Philippines, it's so. I think how I understand it, uh, working in my own community, 
it's so different to use just a particular trope because of how colonialisms have become layered into a particular event. So when we think about ritual, for example, the, you know, the, yung sa ano, um, during Holy Week. Mm -hmm. Semana the, Santa. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not just Filipino traditional culture, right? There are some various events flowing in. For example, migration has not really been, the effects of migration in the production and formation of these events have not yet been fully understood. Especially in my hometown, for example, with just the town of Dollars. These uh, events happen because of the remittances coming from overseas. Mm -hmm. And these migrations were also propelled by racialized labor, such as participating in the US Navy. So to be able to talk about a uh, ritual, it needs an attention to, uh, I think others call them uh, palimpsestic layers, right? Layers and layers. But I think we need to pay attention to how these layers are also um, impacted by multiple and entangled colonialisms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very well said. Uh, Ian Baird has a question. Uh, hi, Ian. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for a, a very interesting talk. Um, I have a question that relates to your, your thinking about colonialism and post-colonialism. And I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned that you were thinking about multiple colonialisms, you know, in terms of the Japanese and the, you know, the Spanish and the Americans. But what about, um, you also had part of your presentation about, you know, some of the, I think you call them the Avaraz, the, the indigenous peoples there. How, do you think that they have been colonized by other Filipinos? So would you, would you consider a kind of internal colonialization? Um, or, or is colonialized, or is colonial, uh, colonialism just about uh, people from other countries? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, I think we are also lacking research in that arena, right? Um, I'm still also understanding the case of maybe internal colonialisms in the Philippines, but for sure, I'm still figuring out in the case of Bicol region, right? Especially. Um, the Agtas, for example, who have moved to the mount to the hills of our region, right? I was uh, I'm still still working on it, but for example, in Mindanao, we are, are still. I think there's a re there's research that needs to be done using the framework of settler colonialism, right? With Christian peoples settling in Mindanao and displacing a lot of indigenous communities there. And I think we have not yet used that so much, or maybe we have, but I have I to think expand I, my reading. I'm not, I'm not so sure about the Philippines, but that was the topic of my PhD dissertation in, in uh, Cambodia and, and Laos. And maybe I'll send you an email with some things that might be of interest for you. Yeah, thank you, thanks. Yeah, I'm still in the very young stage of my book development projects, so I would appreciate uh, suggestions. And also this talk that I, uh, delivered is a work in progress. It's the first draft or so. I delivered this uh, at Stephen's class a couple of weeks ago, and it's the second uh, iteration. So if you think uh, there are some stuff that I should read or improve, I'd be very happy to receive comments also. Yeah, uh, we are always a work in progress as scholars, right? Um, so, Jib, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jib. thanks you for 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 uh, for your answer. Uh, we also have another question from Ik. She's another graduate student. Uh, hi, Ik. Um, so, Ik says many thanks for your inspiring talk, Dada. As part of the fieldwork in your own hometown, could you please share with us your reflection on surprise or perhaps setback when you revisited your hometown? Oh wow! Yeah, thanks, Ik. Yeah, so when I went home, I began to realize that the person who told me not to study my own hometown was actually correct. <laughs> and I began thinking, oh, I should have studied somewhere else, like in Mindanao or in another island, because uh, it was a lot of emotional work, not just work in the sense of academic labor, but 
you know, as a, a lot of migrants, a lot of Filipinos have moved overseas, right? Like 10 million of us. <laughs> so I found myself living um, alone in our home. And to, for it to be livable, I had to spend like three months fixing it, repairing it. Because um, it, it was left empty for a very long time and had to be fixed and it wasn't livable anymore. And apart from that, um, there's also the personal history, right? So when I was uh, in high school, my father uh, was hit by a bus and he died during my high school. And returning there, and I, I actually realized that I did not, I did not know so much about my hometown because when he was, uh, when he had that accident and he was killed uh, on the highway, we were actually never allowed to go around the town. I, the, the, this, the farthest that I could go was to the cemetery, right, when we buried him. But I was not allowed to buy it, to go somewhere else without uh, being accompanied by elders. So I did not know. So what I did was I biked and biked. Huh. And um, there was also a moment when I realized that I, oh, it's so nice to be here, to be back home. And I didn't want to return to Canada anymore to finish my dissertation. And what I did was I started a craft shop. <laughs> I, uh, I what kind of craft? A bamboo craft. Oh, oh the one you <laughs> so, showed in your presentation. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it also, it's connected to family history, right? Because my family members are, were, uh, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, even in the 40s, there was a lot of um, North, global North demand for what they call tropical crafts. Right, so I, this became part of my dissertation. It was uh, also like the film that I showed. It was also not planned. Um, wanting to stay home and to not leave anymore, I thought, oh, let's uh, make, uh, let's revive this project that my grandparents started, which was also capitalist and problematic in a lot of ways. But it's uh, part of one's history, right? And I it went kind of big to the extent that I opened my craft shop my own craft shop in Manila. And before I left, uh, there were already um, exporters, German exporters who came to see me wanting to get bigger orders uh, <laughs> for export. And then my, my family members were like, why are you doing this? You know, how, it, how it's always, uh, conversations in the Philippines with parents are always like, oh, you should not stay here, you should leave, right? Aren't we always told that? That leave, don't stay here, what's your, uh, uh, education for if you leave. It's because of the, the infrastructure of migration that was also set up, right? That we are encouraged to move, to not stay. But some of us, I think it's very much connected to the nostalgia that, also, that Renata Rosal also talks about, right? But in the sense, it's a different kind of nostalgia of wanting to stay and of not wanting to leave. Mm -hmm. But things happened, but it's a, uh, yeah. It's the last chapter of my doctoral project that uh, bamboo craft mm -hmm. business and uh, a discourse basically I linked it to a discourse about hope, right? But also it's a hope anchored on kind of a desperation to want to stay, but also changes in the global market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was very emotional for you to, to go back and do your field work, no? And it, it's not just me, right? It's a common, I think, to a lot of people studying their own communities. They find themselves stuck. Stuck, I guess, is a mm -hmm. word for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Ik says, thank you so much for the sharing. Um, we have another question from Larry. Larry Ashman is our Southeast Asian Studies bibliographer in the university. Hi, Larry. Uh, he says, thanks for an interesting presentation. What does your mother think about your research? Oh, I think, um, I think a lot of Filipinos also feel this, that it's, I think until now, they don't really understand what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm a first generation PhD holder uh -huh. and, um, yeah, my mother uh, went to the University of the Philippines but did not finish and uh, college. So first college and first PME and first PhD. But I think, um, I think they're supportive and mm -hmm. in, in very interesting ways to the extent that when I was home, they were trying to craft the direction of my work. 
Mm. Uh, this is the person you should interview. This is not the person you should interview. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, I, think they, I think we feel invested in the labor of our kin, right? Mm. Whether it is uh, migra- migration work, academia, but maybe not so much in terms of art and creativity. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I think in the, if you come from the provinces, art and creative work is seen to be unproductive. Right, that if you're an artist, because before my first degree in at the University of the Philippines was film, and they thought, oh, you're not going to earn any money there, so they asked me to move to journalism because they said you only need the pen to pass and a piece of paper. <laughs> okay. What are you going to do to become an artist? Nobody becomes an artist, and nobody gets paid to become one, and it's like a crazy field, right? Yeah. But it's also linked to um, the production of peoples as productive individuals. Contributing only in a form of a form of labor that is ex, that could be extracted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I guess people would want to be a creative artista, singer, or yeah. beauty pageant, <laughs> beauty pageant queen. That type of creative outlet, but not like the production aspects that you're talking about, no? <laughs> yeah, not the ano, the the painter or the filmmaker. Yeah, that's, that's like cool. a hobby, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and and parents would say, "Oh, it's it's unproductive. It it, it will not make you rich." <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not yeah. gonna find any anything from those labor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, Larry says thank you. Keep up the Hello, good work. Um, we have another question from Matt Banker. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi. Um, yeah. First off, just thank you so much for this uh, presentation. I think it was. Uh, really important and, and really insightful. Um, but I, I wanted to ask about what you were just talking about in relationship to making movies. Um, and I know you also said that you were just about to finish up your book project. And I'm curious um, when you're, you know, you have all this material that you've got through, you know, various forms of fieldwork. Uh, when you're thinking of it all, how do you sort of decide whether you want to turn something into like a book or a journal article versus um, to turn something into a, a film? What, what things do you consider in deciding how to, uh, I don't know, figure out where you want to, to channel that work? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, I think being in academia makes things a lot more difficult because you have to pass IRB regulations (laughs) (laughs) and it kind of stifles creativity like I I really wanted to make uh, this film projects but I mean it takes like three two or three months to pass an IRB and with all of these consent forms but uh, apart from that uh, it's the social barrier what I do is um, to for example in my organizing work with the UBC Philippine Studies Series before when I was a grad student in Canada, we organized our group in such a way that we produce three forms. We call it the AAA, Academics, Action and Art. So we oriented ourselves that, oh, these are the things that we are producing, not just papers, but also forms that are non-traditional, right? So in our production with that group, they might not be useful academically, because they don't count for tenure or, uh, you know, <laughs> how academia is. But um, we, for example, created a novena, like a prayer, a ritual, uh, recalling, uh, we staged a novena when they were burying Marcus in the cemetery oh, really? of the heroes. So we just gathered among ourselves and a group of uh, two poets um, rewrote uh, the novena for the dead in the Philippines, but in a way that it's um, written like a novena for those killed by Marcus, by the Marcuses. Mm-hmm. So it's not useful in any way, but it's something that we have to do as a community. Mm-hmm. And um, until today, I I try to work with um, activists, uh, activists and artist groups such as the. I think everybody should look up the work of the. Res- of rest back, which is respond and break uh, the silence against the killings. And for that group, we um, did uh, a videoke project 
which is uh, which draws on the the very popular song Christmas song in the Philippines, which is uh, Jose Marichan's Jose Marichan's <laughs> yeah song, and we changed the lyrics, and we basically changed the lyrics to reflect the harms of extrajudicial killings in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how I it's just something that I think we should do, you know. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, we don't have to 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 be useful for tenure. It's just mm -hmm. a form of we have a platform, and it's good to make art, not because we want to be labeled as artists, but because it's something that also draws attention, right? Right. Nobody reads my papers until now. Nobody has cited me. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we didn't. We don't know yet. <laughs> Well, some people have, but my article from 2017 still has no citation. And, <laughs> and then also the 2019 in current anthropology. Uh, hopefully somebody will, but the <laughs> film has been screened worldwide. Mm -hmm. So that is okay. Yeah. And it's more I'm, impactful, I'm, I think. Yeah. I'm putting Restbox Facebook account there in, in the chat so people could see it. Yeah. So Matt says, thank you for that. I love thinking about the AAAs. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question from um, Maureen Ustiniano. Hi, Mao. Uh, she's Hi, now Mao. in DC. Um, so Mao says, "Thank you for your presentation. My question is: Would you consider examining the effects of Catholicism as a separate but equally influential force in shaping Filipinos' perspective on racial discourse or in knowledge production? I, I, the role of religion." Uh, the role of religion in uh, uh, in shaping Filipinos perspectives on racial discourse and yes, knowledge really. production yeah uh, yes. specifically her question is about Catholicism's influence yes um, I was reading uh, Fernando Ziel Cita's article about the uh, black Nazarene and it was uh, it made me really think about how yeah religious discourse does affect people's perceptions about colorism and race, right? I was also a Catholic school girl. <laughs> I think uh -huh. many Filipinos went to Catholic <laughs> school. And um, imagine growing up uh, praying to a white saint, right? And uh, going to Piapo church and wondering why is he black? Right, and there's this uh, piece about uh, written by Rizal Moharis. Um, it's a very wonderful about uh, the life of one of the saints. I think it was Pedro Calungsod or one of the Filipino saints. I think it's Pedro Calungsod mm -hmm. or uh, yeah, another Filipino icon that um, and uh, traces. He traces uh, the how, for example, sainthood is also a path towards victimizing others in the context of colonization, right? And I think about, so I'm, I'm not Catholic, I'm, I'm agnostic. Well, I, I was raised, I was raised and uh, baptized Catholic, but um, I think I can say that even my research, my field site, I think it's very much crafted, uh, was crafted within a kind of consciousness that is, um, I would say decolonizing and critical of the of the of institutions, right? Not exactly about faith, because I think my, my mother she prays every day, and I find her faith and the praying the rosary really reflective and wonderful, right? That she's able to stay quiet and meditate, and I think such faith is impressive. But in terms of religions as institutions, right? I think it's um, yeah. There's a lot of critique that could be put in into it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to talk about this in terms of Filipinos uh, with your informants, a lot of them being Catholics, right? Because they might think, uh, oh, you're a stanista. <laughs> 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 but I'm not. I mean, it's just, uh, I do respect people's faith. But uh, studying in my hometown, for example, the church was not my field site. I think a lot of ethnographers, a lot of anthropologists go to the church to get their uh, pool of informants. It's a common resource for anthropologists to go to the church and to observe religious ritual, 
-hmm. But for me, that was not a space at all for me. And I was very conscious of that. And I think I produced other data because I did not go on that path. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for the question, Mao. Um, Thanks, Mao. We, we only have uh, a few minutes left. We will entertain one more final question. Um, if there aren't, um, is Mary still here? Yes, I am. Hi, Mary. Yeah. I think we're done with uh, the Q&A portion. Yes, thank you so uh, much, everybody, for, for this live so discussion. Thank you, thank you, Dada, also. Thank you. For, for agreeing to be, uh, to, to be our speaker. Um, so I give the floor now to Mary.